these are two members of the crocodile family. Uh, this is a gharial from uh, India, and this is a saltwater crocodile from Australia. One of the things we see as we look at these two skulls is that they're related animals, and every bit of the skull matches. They are adapted to catch different kinds of prey. This one's adapted to catch fish. This one's adapted to catch large animals that are on land. What this one needs is rapid movement of the jaws, snapping them shut with immense speed, with very little water resistance. What this one has is the ability not to shut the jaws particularly fast, but great force for hanging on and then crushing bones once it's got it. You cannot have both. Evolution is filled with compromises. You can't have both high speed and great force. There are many other such compromises. So far, we've seen how a crocodile bites. The next stage of the kill is to pull the prey into the water and drown it. And to do that, the crocodile has had to evolve teeth tough enough to take the strain. The teeth of this animal's jaws are very simplistic. They're, they're just cones, and they're not particularly sharp. What they're designed to do is sustain stresses from any direction. So when they get a hold of a prey item and it's struggling, it's not likely to break their teeth no matter which way they bend. Also, these animals, once they get a hold of a prey item, will go into death rolls, they'll spin, and the teeth can sustain that. Crocs don't have sharp teeth to slice through meat, so they use what's known as the death roll to tear off chunks of food. One of the mysteries of the death roll is how crocs manage to keep their mouth open underwater without drowning. Comparative anatomist Joy Reidenberg knows how they do it. She's looked down the throats of hundreds of animals and is a world expert on vocal and breathing anatomy. We're looking at the tip of the snout of the crocodile and right here are the nostrils. And these have little valves so they can flop open, allow air in, and then close up like little plugs. And then you have a passageway that runs from the tip of the rostrum all the way inside the skull and then dives down into the larynx, which is below this. And if we open up the mouth, Alan, if you could just lift that up for me, we see inside the complicated arrangement of the inside of this mouth has a valve that keeps water from going into the larynx or voice box. So this ridge over here overlaps with a soft palate, and that keeps water from getting into the larynx. And when we open it up and look inside, if you can lift that a little bit higher, we can see inside there is a voice box right here. This is the larynx, and there's the opening into the larynx. And we're looking down a pipe that goes down to the trachea and all the way down to the lungs. So this is where air would pass. And when this animal elevates its larynx up like that, it seals this opening, and it's connecting the opening of the larynx into the nasal passageway, which is back here. So this animal has a built-in snorkel to allow it to breathe from the nose all the way down to the lungs and not let water that's in its mouth get into here and drown the animal. If the animal wants to grab a fish, this is also a wonderful trap for catching a fish, but if it's lying on the bottom of a riverbank with its mouth open like this, waiting for a fish to swim across, it needs to make a current to actually draw the fish into the mouth so the fish doesn't keep swimming right by. And it does that by using the tongue as a piston. So this big, broad, flat tongue just drops down like that. And now the fish is drawn in with the current, and then it can go ahead and snap those jaws shut, trapping the fish. Crocodiles have an amazing sensory repertoire. And when these animals are in the water, their whole body can be submerged, except for just the cranial table here, in other words, the top of the skull. And when they do that, they have great sense of what's around them. This is the ear flap here, so they can pick up airborne sounds. Here's the eye right here. It has a vertical uh, pupil to it. So these animals uh, have great daylight vision and night vision as well. Now, what's interesting also on the face here is that you see these little dots. Those are the dome pressure sensors. This allows it to sense motion in the water. So if there's a splashing fish, uh, it can sense it and move towards it. We've seen that the croc's head is equipped with the hardware it needs to trap and kill its prey. But first, it has to catch that prey. And to do that, it uses a huge piece of anatomy representing almost half of its body, its tail.
What I'm doing here is I'm exposing the tail muscles of this crocodile, and uh, what I want to show you here is that this is almost all muscle in the tail. There's very little bone here, and if you pull this back, that whole thickness, almost as deep as my hand can go there, is solid muscle. That's on one side, the same as on the other side. So almost all of this bulk is just muscle. Let's go ahead and flop this over. There's the propeller. These fins right here are made out of keratin. They're really stiff, just like what your fingernails are made out of. What these animals do is they thrust their tail back and forth like this, and, that, and because it has an S-shaped motion to it, it causes uh, thrust to be generated backwards and allows these animals to move forward. They can swim like 20 miles an hour. It's, it's really amazing. Crocodiles have evolved as masters of the water. But as biomechanics expert John Hutchinson knows, crocs can also get around on land in more ways than you might think. We've got a nice big left front leg and hind leg of our crocodile. When the animal's going fairly slowly on muddy ground or down a slope, it will use kind of a primitive gait called the belly slide, where they just basically push themselves along with their belly on the ground. Very primitive kind of motion. But when the crocodile wants to go a bit more quickly on land, it can lift itself up, kind of doing push-ups, and do what's called a high walk. You can see the foot is pointing forwards rather than out to the side, so its ankle is able to rotate. And also the uh, knee is wonderfully flexible. It can flex and extend. It can rotate from left to right. You try that with your knee, you'll be ripping ligaments, muscles, everything. It'd be very painful. But then, you might not know that they actually have a different kind of gait, even faster, when they want to really want to move quickly. And that's called the bound. We have a clip of that from my research here coming up. You can see uh, the crocodile there. And look at that. It's, it's using its forelimbs together to push itself forward and its hind limbs, left and right, synchronized to do this kind of bounding gait and holding the tail quite clear of the ground. When would they use that gait? Juvenile crocodiles need that kind of gait to escape predators or maybe even catch prey occasionally or just get to the water when they're frightened. But they do get tired really quickly and then they're just done. Once they're tired out, they're done sometimes for a day or two, just so fatigued from using this kind of motion. And this crocodile here probably couldn't have bounded. Its legs are just relatively too small and weak compared with its, with its body. So this is a survival gait? Mm, it, it, it definitely is and it probably always has been. It's thought this running ability may date back to the time of the dinosaurs, when small crocodile ancestors ran down their prey. 200 million years ago, ancient crocodile relatives lived on land. Like Terrestris sucus, a long-legged reptile not much bigger than a rabbit. Later, some crocs took to the water, their eyes and nostrils move to the top of their heads, allowing them to keep a low profile. And supported by water, their bodies dramatically increased in size. 110 million years ago, enormous megacrocs like Sarcosuchus grew over 10 meters long. These supercrocs died out, but their smaller cousins flourished and started to resemble more modern crocodiles. Remarkably, over the last 100 million years, they've hardly changed at all. 